What is this place? Hey, isn't that Atea's talisman? <laughs> Good eye. This is where I store all the various mementos I've collected. Wow. I've never seen this place before. There are so many things in here. It looks like there are items from every tribe. Collecting them must have taken a lot of effort. I suppose you could think of it as a hobby of sorts. In Natlan, everyone grows up listening to the stories of heroes. And physical items do a far better job of preserving those stories than our own memory. <sighs> now, I still have some preparations to make for the ceremony, so feel free to take a look around in the meantime. If you're curious about an item, I'm more than willing to tell you about its origins. It looks familiar. Hey, there's a fishing rod here! It must have belonged to the people of the springs. That's right. It belongs to a legendary fisherman named Matavaru. I have his entire set of fishing equipment, actually. He and I met in a tavern. He told me about a particular kind of giant fish and his meticulous plan to catch it. In his eyes, I saw a hunger and a strong fighting spirit. To him, the sea was the battlefield upon which he staked his honor. So, did he do it? The next time I saw him, he was covered in scars. It turned out the fish he sought had been corroded by the abyss. He managed to kill the fish, but... Sustained a serious injury in the process, which meant he could never go deep-sea fishing again. Can a fisherman claim victory if he fails to bring back his catch? That's what he asked me in the end. Well, Paimon thinks he won. That was my answer as well. The experience was far more valuable than the prize itself. In the end, he didn't want his tools to go to waste. So he gave them to me. Wait, that means you also know how to fish. <laughs> Maybe we can go head to head sometime. Make sure to handle everything with care. This cup, for example, it's heavier than it looks. Oh, that belt is bigger than Paimon's head! The Collective of Plenty are known for their bodybuilding competitions and contests of strength. This belt is a symbol of great honor within the tribe. The association with strength might also have been the reason the original belt was extremely heavy. It was difficult for even two people to lift. And even if a warrior had the strength to put it on, Wearing it for any length of time would still leave them gasping for breath. Sounds like it. So the owner of the original belt, Katera, commissioned a craftsman to make a copy identical in appearance but far lighter in weight. That is the belt you see before you. He would often wear this version when training in order to protect his waist. Or he made a lighter version so he could wear it all the time and show it off. This flower looks like it's thriving. You must be good at taking care of plants, Archon. There are so many jars and potions around here. Do they have anything to do with alchemy? No, those belong to the masters of the Nightwind. Their ceremonial tools used to amplify the ability to communicate with the Night Kingdom and the Wyab. Yamaya is an expert in this field, and she taught me a lot. Even though she appears stoic and serious, 
She actually has a keen sense of humor. The tools you see here are quite traditional. Her students found them outdated, so she passed them on to me. The contents of the jars aren't all that special. Oh, uh, except the big jar in the middle. That's what she really wanted to give me. Ooh, must be something really cool. What's inside? Grape juice. Huh? <laughs> it's quite tasty, although probably expired by now. This is a Taya's talisman. I'm sure you're familiar with this one already. Atea was rarely ever without it. The talisman brought her a lot of luck in battle. Whoa, this weapon is huge! Which tribe did it belong to? Ah, that weapon belonged to Tainoch, a hero from 500 years ago. Strictly speaking, he didn't belong to any single tribe. That's because even before the disaster with the Abyss broke out, he had already been exiled. Exiled? It was a punishment imposed out of necessity, but he accepted it all the same. He believed it was what he deserved. When the Abyss attacked, the tribes found themselves in urgent need of a powerful figure to lead them into the battle, and there was no one more courageous or resolute than him. He united the six tribes and accomplished great feats throughout the war. Ultimately, he perished, and because he had already lost his ancient name, the Ode of Resurrection was unable to bring him back. And so, he was laid to rest alongside the countless warriors and civilians who lost their lives, buried in the soil of his native land. Wow, he sounds like a true hero. <laughs> Indeed, even now his story is told throughout the land. still needs some time to settle, so let's wait a little longer. Well, what do you think of my collection? Do you feel like you have a better understanding of Natland's culture now? Yeah! If each item represents a different story, seems like Natland's really been through a lot! Does every item hold a special memory, just like Atea's talisman? That's right. The items in my collection actually serve a similar purpose to the ancient names passed down among the tribes. They demonstrate the true shape of time. The shape of time? Most people perceive time as a linear concept, almost like a straight line that can only move forward. We cannot change the past or predict the future. But there's also a different theory, one that I believe to be closer to the truth. Namely, that the past, present, and future all exist at once. At once? Paimon's not sure she understands. Uh, let's say your journey ended right now. Thinking back on your experience in each nation, which one would you say was the most important? Exactly. Even at the end of your journey, the things you experienced along the way don't cease to exist. They become part of who you are. 
Take out a portion of that journey and you would likely make very different decisions and eventually arrive at a very different destination. The future is the same way. It exists even though it has yet to come to pass. We just lack the means to perceive it. Of course, there are those with the power to foresee the future. They simply call it by a different name. Fate. <laughs> You're quite familiar with that concept, I would imagine. Uh, that does kind of make sense. The future hasn't happened, but already exists. Humanity excels at living in the present, but too often we forget the past and neglect the future. While the pilgrimage and the Night Warden Wars lead us to a better future. Only by uniting the people of Natlan across countless eras can we fight back against an enemy as formidable as the Abyss. To come up with such a set of rules, the first Pyro Archon must have possessed a level of insight I can only imagine. That's correct. At first, he was a mortal man with no special power. After he ascended to the Divine Throne, he used it to borrow power from the heavens and establish the rules of Natlan. Namely, a framework through which ordinary people can ascend to Archonhood. By holding the pilgrimage, we're able to determine the strongest among us. And when that person ascends to the Divine Throne, their inner flame will awaken. In addition, the Sacred Flame will grant them significant knowledge and memory of this land. After all, that's how I came to know everything I just told you. So, it all comes down to the power of the Divine Throne and the rules. Wait, is that... A family portrait? <laughs> yes. That's my mother, father, younger sister, and the little Saurians we raised. I turned a piece of my dad's leather armor into a canvas and commissioned a famous artist to paint our likeness. Your sister is so cute! It looks like the two of you are really close. I'm always having a hard time thinking of an Archon as an ordinary person, but seeing this portrait, it kind of makes sense now. It really doesn't look like there was anything special about you before. Oh, wait, is Paimon allowed to say that? A little late for that question, don't you think? Sorry! Paimon's so sorry! Paimon's mouth works faster than her brain sometimes! <laughs> it's alright. I'd never get upset over something like that. No matter what others may say, my past is a precious part of my identity. I'm forever proud of the life I used to lead. Becoming the Archon doesn't mean you sever ties with your family. The position just comes with a lot of responsibilities, so it impacts how often you get to see them. My father made the most delicious stew, so my sister would often bring me a large pot of his cooking, and we would sit on a blanket and eat it together. One time, we didn't close the door securely, and the Saurians you were raising ran into the room and knocked over the entire pot. My sister immediately burst into tears. The two troublemakers were going for the meat, but when they saw my sister's distress, they froze on the spot. I still remember the way they laid there, sulking like a pair of children, even after making such a mess. It was frustrating, but in the end, all I could do was comfort my sister and move on. Wow. Isn't that what being a family is all about? <laughs> I think about that story a lot, actually. As the Archon, I made a vow to defend this nation. And experiences like that, they remind me exactly what I'm trying to protect. Well, what happened after that? This portrait looks pretty old. Your sister must be all grown up by now, right? I believe she ended up working as an architect and artist. She built many houses and crafted many beautiful works of art. Anyway, that's enough about me. Now that the powder is settled, we can begin. <laughs>